Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus, chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments, or what we started last week, Ten Rules for Living. And if you remember last week, as uh, I began this study, uh, we started looking at that first commandment, or to begin with God. And our week ought to begin with God. And our Monday morning ought to begin with God. And every aspect of our life, from our family to our work, ought to begin with God. Now, this second commandment is an interesting uh, commandment. You're going to notice it begin to speak about a graven image or an idol. And it will define that we should not or shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And uh, if you will, in honor of God's word, stand with me. We're going to read Exodus chapter 20 verses 4, 5, and 6, and we'll read these three verses all together in unison. Ready? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me to keep my commandments. And these ten rules for living, the second commandment is a commandment saying that we ought not to make any graven image or any idol in our life. And it is a powerful thought when we dig a little bit deeper. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And thank you for the infinite, when your infinite wisdom giving us these Ten Commandments. Uh, they can guide us, direct us. They can tell us how to interact with you and then interact with people. And God, I pray that you help us to uh, not just come here vainly, but delight in your word this morning. Help me to decrease, you to increase. Please bless every aspect of the message. We need you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. In a sea of sin, going down for the last time when you called upon his name. He reached down his nail scarred hand and lifted you out. So remember where you were back then and thank him for where you are now give him the glory for what he's done in your heart he took you from sin and strife and gave a new start he took your broken life and made you complete so take off your crowns of glory and cast them at the Savior's feet do you remember when with all your heart you long to serve him you didn't think that Jesus could use someone like you. Now look how he's used your life since he called you out. And remember where you were back then and thank him for He's done in your heart. He took you from sin and strife and gave 
At the Savior's feet So take off your crowns of glory And cast them At the Savior's feet Amen. I'm excited about it And uh, you may not be excited yet But you'll get excited once you hear this great truth And uh we think of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are good, good principles to live by, but the Ten Commandments have never saved you. Uh, we are all sinners destined to die and go to hell, but Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He came 2,000 years ago, lived an absolute perfect life, died on the old rugged cross for our sins, and glory be to God, it's through Jesus we are gloriously saved. Now, because Jesus saved you, does that make the commandment of not, none effect? Romans says, God forbid. We think about it, when I, when I uh, was uh, four years old, I was uh, adopted. My last name used to be Zezelak, and I became a netizan. My dad, who adopted me, began to put some rules together. I remember I broke one of those rules. I didn't take out the trash. When my dad told me to take out the trash, I willfully was disobedient. Now, it didn't make my dad happy. He uh, certainly still loved me. He did not kick me out of his family. But our relationship, there was uh, some tension in it. And what I needed to do and what I did is after he gave me a whipping, uh, I said, Dad, forgive me. And our relationship was restored. These commandments right here, they'll never save you, but they will help you with your relationship with the Almighty Amen. God. Amen. You have to remember that. This uh, interesting commandment, look back with me at chapter 20, verse number 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Bowing to an image? To me, it seems almost foreign. It, it seems like, well, of course, we wouldn't bow down to an image. I remember growing up, I had a friend whose parents were Buddhists, and uh, I would go to his house, and it was often awkward. His mom and dad would be bowing down, and chanting uh, towards the Buddha doll. And, uh, but as I walked in there, I, I never had any desire to stop and to bow down to the Buddha doll. There was never in, any inclination in my heart to look at that Buddha doll and bow down and worship him. My friend was often embarrassed about the whole situation. How about you? Do you have some deep down longing to bow down to maybe a Buddha doll? Does anyone feel tempted right now if I put a Buddha statue up here or some other idol up here to bow down and worship that idol right there? So, so does this command then really have anything to say to you and me? You know, we don't have any inclination to do that seemingly. So should we have just skipped commandment number two and gone to commandment two, number three? Is this sermon even needed this morning? And I just want to say absolutely it is indeed needed. This command actually has a lot to say to both you and to me. But what we need to do before we uh, go any further is to dig a little bit deeper, to look a little bit more. And I want to begin by explaining. Think with me. How about how, do, how did this law or this rule come into effect? How did we get here? How did men come down uh, to get to the point where they began to make images of their gods or God? You think about where did this whole image making business come from? And the answer to that question is really quite obvious and it's evident. We can be sure that those who first made these objects, these idols, uh, these images of their gods, were doing so, uh, were not doing so to destroy religion. They were trying to get closer to their God or their religion. They had a purpose behind what they were doing. Men naturally, think with me, men naturally found it hard to imagine a god or gods that they could not see. You understand that they had a hard time imagining a god that they couldn't see. When, when he prayed, he too often felt in, as he was praying that he's praying into space and uh, he was uttering words and nobody could actually hear him. 
And so what they did is they began to make an image to assist their maybe weak imagination. He was trying to bring maybe a sense of reality into their worship. And you can see this done throughout history. Baal worship, uh, Dagon, the Egyptians did this, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Persians, the Romans, and even quote-unquote Christian religions have done this. And then you might think with me, the Catholics do this. Uh, nowadays in the modern world, uh, there is Mary worship. And when you think about it, Mary worship, where you can have a grilled cheese sandwich that has sort of an image of Mary on their sell on eBay for $28,000. It becomes an idol. And uh, we think about that. There's, a, by the way, a story of a certain saint, a Scottish saint, who was struggling in his prayer life. So he went to his pastor and he said, Pastor, I'm struggling. I know God's real, but it's hard for me as I kneel down and begin to pray to actually think that he hears me. The pastor made a suggestion. He says, well, do this. As you pray, put an empty chair right there and just picture Jesus uh, in that chair, and as you pray, you're praying to the Lord Jesus Christ in that chair. And so he began to have a devout uh, prayer life, and as he imagined Jesus being in that chair, it helped him in his prayer life, and uh, that Christian eventually went up to glory. But, but think with me for a second, uh, this thought, the images that these ancient people made in order to help them in their worship were perhaps a real assistance for a time. They were a real help for a time, but in the end, those images became an hindrance and a snare. I want to read a verse in Romans chapter 1. And think with me, Romans chapter 1, starting verse 21, says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to, to be wise, they became fools. And then listen to this statement and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And this is the, the case with those idol worships. It, 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 little by little, the worshipers came, so to, came to fix their gaze upon the image that they made, and, and they forgot what the image, uh, what was it originally there for. They became ex absorbed in the means that they forgot the end. Uh, it, it's so concerned in the picture that they lost sight of reality. They were so intent upon that which was to help them realize that God, uh, realize what was God, that they lost sight of God altogether. It was as if this Scottish man who used the chair to help him imagine God sitting in that chair, began to worship the chair instead of the God that was going to be sitting in that chair. And you think about it, maybe it happened little by little, step by step, but the temptation thus is for you and for me to take our eyes off the goal. The goal is God. And to confuse the means with the end. And it's found in almost every aspect of our life. Maybe we're not setting up an image and worshiping an image, but there are often things that rather than serving the Creator, we are worshiping and bowing down to an image or putting something in place of God. Therefore, this rule is for you and it is for me. And it long ceases to be dead. It would be good, uh, as it was good several thousand years ago, uh, it's good today, it'll be good 10,000 years from now. Keep your eye on the goal. That's the title of the sermon is keep your eyes on the goal. I'm going to say it again. Keep your eyes uh, on the goal. It becomes a principle to live by. Uh, we all struggle with the temptation to take our eyes off the Almighty God. By the way, just a thought real quick. What is our goal? What is our end of everything we do? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 tells us and reminds us, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. Amen. So if something, a chair, a cheese sandwich, or anything hinders us from the goal, the goal of doing all to the glory of God, it then becomes an idol, a graven image that we bow down and worship. Now, we're going to go through a couple things, and uh, I think this will help you as we go. But the first one, keep your eye on the goal in your eating and drinking. All right, well, you will get there. Keep your eye on the goal and you're eating and drinking. Take, take this matter, for example, me and my wife, 
Uh, I knew she was having surgery on Thursday, so I said, Mandy, why don't we uh, go out on uh, Tuesday? And I surprised her. I took her to a neat restaurant off of Thalia Road, and uh, it was an elegant restaurant. She dressed up in her uh, red, uh, just a red outfit, and she got her red hat on, looked beautiful as could be. And uh, she got fried shrimp. She liked it. It was good. I got prime rib to the glory of God, the Father. And uh, it was wonderful. And afterwards, uh, we're, we're sitting in this, uh, right by this windows that were overlooking this beautiful waterway uh, there. And uh, we walked outside and got standing right in front of that uh, waterway. The sun was almost starting to go down. And I looked at her. I grabbed her and I gave her a beautiful kiss. And uh, she turned as red as her red hat. And uh, it was good. Eating and drinking. You think about that. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone. And by the way, that is true. Man shall not live by bread alone. But it is also equally true that we cannot live without bread. Would you agree with that? Well, we cannot live without bread. And while we must eat in order to live, think about this. We must eat eat in order to live, we need to bear in mind that eating is a means to an end and not an end in and of itself. Uh, we must eat to live, but when all of a sudden we're eating, we're living to eat, in other words, we're living, our life is lived to the point where we're living to eat, but we've got a problem. We've put something before the Almighty God. We should eat to live so we can live for the glory of God. Okay, uh, I, I wanted to say, I said, say it three times. It is wise to eat to live, but it is foolish and deadly to live to eat. And I'll say it three times just so you get this and it'll start making sense to you. It is wise to eat to live. You got to eat, uh, but it is foolish and deadly to live to eat. Oh, for example, a uh, red of a man, a man who lived to eat. He loved to eat. It was a number one priority in his life. He lived to eat. And uh, his main meal was the evening meal. But he went to an all-you-could-eat restaurant for lunch. And at that all-you-can-eat restaurant, he ate 72 raw oysters. Uh, enough, for, enough food for 12 men. And the same man, by the way, struggled in his health. And he died at an early age. His problem, he took his eyes off the goal. He lived to eat rather than eating to live. And we can all be guilty of this at some times. It's putting something in front of God. He's living to eat. His whole goal in life is to eat. And his idol is his food right there, which hinders his relationship from the Almighty God. Hey, don't eat, uh, don't live to eat, but eat to live and serve God for his all is honor and glory. Now, none of us have much of a problem with that, probably. Uh, well, brownies, amen. <laughs> Eat brownies to live, not uh, live to eat brownies. Amen. But number two, keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the goal. Uh, keep your eyes on the goal. Number two, number one, maybe not, but this, this one can step on some toes, and rightfully so, in our entertainment and our amusement. Uh, last night, Mandy and I, she's got her leg, and it's hurt, and uh, I don't know, probably 6.30 or so last night. I uh, gathered up the family in the living room, and Mandy sat there. She put her leg up there, and I sat right next to her leg. Uh, I put Nehemiah in my lap, and uh, Sam Sam's right next to me. We got all the kids there. And I have, uh, a, we have a TV in our, in our house, and I have uh, 320 Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdoms. And uh, 320, and we watched a, a, a couple of those last night. We watched one about camels. And uh, they were going to capture some wild camels in Australia. And uh, boy, they had these cowboys rounding up these camels. It was excited and through it, some of these camels looked vicious. And my Sam Sam, he's getting scared of the camels, holding on tight. And oh, I was holding them tight. I was be all right. I got the camels right here. We fend them off right here for you, buddy. And uh, boy, we enjoyed that. We watched one other episode and it was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom's Most Dangerous Moments. And oh, wow, was it interesting. They had a dangerous moment, this man going off the cliff and trying to capture a condor, and the condor begins to claw him. And the whole time, I'm getting clawed by Sam Sam on the right here. It's dangerous for me. Uh, they had the uh, big anaconda snake where Merlin jumps into the water in uh, Brazil, and uh, the snake begins to pull them in the water, and it's got them wrapped around the neck and like this and all. And uh, the Sam Sam at that time was wrapping his arms around my neck like this. It was, oh, it was dangerous for me. Entertainment. 
entertainment. Everybody needs to enjoy some kind of pastime. I think it's good. It's good to enjoy some sort of pastime. To, uh, there's moments in your life you need that. Uh, but there's a difference between living for entertainment and having some entertainment in our lives. I'm going to say it again. It's a big difference between living for entertainment and having some entertainment in life. And I'll say it. Many people bow down to the image of entertainment. They bow, bow down to the idol of the TV. They bow down to the idol of a cell phone. As a matter of fact, some people come to church, can't even get off the cell phone. Uh, sometimes they'll bow down to social media. Sometimes they'll bow down to the internet or they'll bow down to sports or bow down to video games. They live to be entertained. They bow down to their God and this is not good. They live to be entertained rather than have some entertainment so they can live for the, all glo the glory of God. And remember to keep your eye on the goal. You know, it's crazy. I read an article. Colleges now offer a degree in esports. Esports. Uh, esports is video game ability, and they'll offer you a scholarship that you can get for playing video games. And I think about that. Well, what is that good for? It's good for nothing unless you're making entertainment your God. And many people make entertainment God rather than remember they do all to the glory of God. They live for entertainment. They live for it. And that is idol worship and breaking the second commandment. Okay, well, we're, we're fine there. We're fine there. But we get to number three. This is dangerous ground. Okay? Uh, because number three, it's not just in food and you know, your drink and it's not just your entertainment. But number three, in keeping your eye on the goal, making money. Making money. There's the matter of making money. Mandy and I, are, are praise God, we're well taken care of as a, uh, from the church. I just want to say praise God for this church. You, you treat me and Mandy and my family exceptionally well. We're thankful that we're supported by this church. And uh, wow, we are well taken care of. It's a blessing uh, that the church takes care of us so well. Can I just say that? Praise God. Um, now, uh, a few years ago, Mandy and I, we had a house in Virginia Beach. We wanted to move closer to the church right there and had a, a thought, sell that house and uh, move here or keep the house and rent it. So a few years ago, we decided to rent that, keep that house and rent it. And so we've rented that and recently had to get a new people in that house in Virginia Beach and have it rented. And uh, the rent went up several hundred dollars. And so every month, Pastor and Mrs. Nettesheim, uh, Mrs. Nettesheim and Pastor, we're, 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 we're $500 above. Amen. Now, it may not be woohoo for you, but an extra $500 a month for a pastor. Yeah. Oh, oh, spiritual ones out there. You're all spiritual. Uh, spiritual ones. And uh, praise God. There's been, a, been quite a, a bit of foolish talk over the years about money making. Foolish talk. Some have sneered at it as if it were a sin or something wicked to make money. This has been the case in spite of the fact that all of us, every one of us, use money every day. Do we not? Okay. We, we have to, make, uh, we, we have to uh, make money to live. We have to make money to live. We need a house, food, car, taxes, brownies. <laughs> To say that making money is evil in and of itself is truly a false statement. Right. I'm going to say it again. It's truly a false statement. It is perfectly okay to work and make money for a living. Matter of fact, you read the Bible, we ought to work and make money for a living. You men that don't make money, and uh, you're worse than an infidel, the Bible tells us. Do it not? Somebody was telling me this week, they went to the Social Security uh, Department. Uh, they got to that age, and they said it was full of young people seeking a disability or something like that, and, and it was pitiful. They had to wait five hours there, and so many people are looking to... Uh, be given a handout, you might say, and you see living off the government welfare, and there are certain cases where it's all well and good, but there's many cases where it's not. Uh, yesterday, seeing some young people, young people, maybe 20, 21 years of age, over in the parking lot, over at Walmart, asking for hands out, begging for food, smoking their cigarettes. I shake my hand, and I want to say, just get to work. Amen. Just get to work. Amen. Can I say that? Right. Get to work. But, but let's not forget the point. It is perfectly okay to work and make money for a living. Uh, so, we, we, so think with me about, about money for a moment. The problem comes when we do not keep our eye on the goal. Okay? 
we should not live to make money, but rather make money to live. We should not live to make money, but rather make money to live. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells us that. But godliness with contentment is great, great gain. Uh, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take, uh, carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the... Love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The same chapter, verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So we're not living to be rich, living to make money, but making money so we can live for His honor and glory. Amen. We're making money so we can live and put God first in our lives. And so sometimes we get it backwards right there. Sometimes the backwardsness is people begin to love money more than God. They begin to make decisions based on money and not based on God. They begin to make all their direction, all their, their thoughts. That's why people often, don't say it past, but they work on Sundays. That's why often they'll make a decision on a job or something like this and the decision based on what God wants them to do, but what money and they love money and they're like the ease of money and they love God. And that becomes an idol, if I may say. That's why I said it was dangerous. Let me tell you a story. It was in, uh, you ever heard of the McGuffey's Reader? It helped people many times to learn to read. Anybody ever heard of that, the McGuffey's Reader? Okay. Uh, there was a story about a miser uh, who under his basement, he had his normal basement, but under his basement he had a secret compartment. And he'd open that secret compartment and he had, uh, you know, he'd been laying up treasures, uh, money, silver coins and gold coins and just laid them up. And he'd go down there. Nobody knew he'd go down, but he'd go in that secret compartment, open up, and uh, he would run his fingers through his coins. And they'd go clank, 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 clank. And he'd go, oh, me beauties. Oh, me beauties. And he was one that loved money. Uh, but one day, while he was worshiping his beauties, you might say, a little bit of a wind or gust or something hit that door and it spring loaded, went boom, and it automatically locked on him. And nobody knew it was down there. And he was stuck down there and died. Wow. You think about that. Years later, when the men tore down that old house, they found a skeleton drooped over this heap of coins. He had taken money and made it his God, and that God destroyed him. Wow. By that, that's the way it is. When you live to make money, you live for money, oh, you put it backwards right there, money will destroy you. It becomes a graven image. Hey, let's uh, uh, make money to live so we can serve the Almighty God, not live to make money. Now, this is the fourth one right here. And uh, not only is it eating and drinking, and uh, you think about uh, the, what was the second one? Entertainment. Entertainment and money. But the third one is popularity. Keep your eye on the goal. Popularity. This is really interesting. Um, I remember being a kid, by the way. Uh, growing up, some of you, it's hard to imagine me being a kid, but there, there was a time. <laughs> growing up, I wanted, pe I wanted people to like me. I desired in some ways to be popular. I ran for school president in the eighth grade. And I remember the eighth grade, we had an auditorium right there. I got up to give my uh, vote for me to be president speech. And boy, it was a valiant. I'd made buttons vote for Matt Nettesheim to be president. It was great. And uh, I thought I gave a rousing speech. And then the, the other kid came up after me, and he didn't even give a speech. He just threw candy. <laughs> he won in a landslide. And uh, I lost. But we would all, listen to me, before you disagree with this statement, we would all like people to like us. We would all like people to like us. Uh, social media. We like it when people like us on social media. Friends. Uh, we like thumbs up. We like it when people like what we have posted, you might say. Pastor Lee Robertson, by the way, recommended a book to all his future pastors to read. Uh, an old book from the 1930s, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And that book is basically a book written on how to get people to like you. And uh, it's a good book. 
But, but imagine with me for a moment, as before you, you get, forget this, what this is about, imagine with me what I do for a living. It, what if nobody liked Pastor Nettesheim? If that were the case, nobody would come to church here, nobody would listen to me preach. Right? Yeah. Well, that's true. Amen. Well, okay, think about this. You go to a job interview. You would like the one giving you the interview to like you so you can get a job. Right? right? Okay, uh, what about if you have a job? Wouldn't it be good if your boss liked you? Oh, yeah. Of course, it's sort of popularity, and you think about that. A little popularity is a good thing, but... When you live to be popular, rather than you be popular to live, you've forgotten your goal. Right. And some of you may have lost you right there, but when you live to be popular, your whole life is lived to get thumbs up on Facebook. Your whole life is lived to get friends on a social media. Your whole goal is to get your videos uh, liked or people to view those videos. The whole the purpose of living is to get people to like you and for you to be popular. All of a sudden, you've taken your eyes off the goal and the goal is to please Him. But if you think about this with me, a little popular is a good thing. thing. You've forgotten your goal. Be popular uh, for the glory of God. Have people like you so you can give God honor and glory. Okay, uh, a little bit more. You, you think about a Sunday school teacher. It's a hard thing to be a Sunday school teacher and get anybody to go to Sunday class if they don't like you. Is that true? So there's nothing wrong with befriending people and trying to be kind to them. The Bible tells us, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. It teaches a lot of that in the Bible right there. But why? So you can influence them for the cause of Christ. Amen. You understand that? It's so important. Uh, when you live to be popular rather than be popular to live, you've forgotten your goal. Okay, some of you are not getting that. When you live to be popular, well, that's idol worship. But when you try to have people like you or popular, why? For the honor and glory of God, there's nothing wrong with that. So be popular for, uh, to live so you can influence people for the cause of Christ. Amen. Think about your, your, your parents, your mom, uh, or your dad. Well, I don't care if my kids like me. I'm just going to, they better obey me just because that's the right thing to do. All of a sudden, they've forgotten a relationship right there. Well, sure, they ought to obey you, but there's nothing wrong to have a good relationship with your kids. Right? Be kind to your kids. Uh, treat them with respect and understanding. Yes, they ought to obey you, but have a friendship with them. And you'll have a lasting relationship. When you have just disciplinarian, discipline, you better obey me. You wonder why there's problems eventually when they grow up. Right. You understand that? So it's, it has to do with your marriage. Well, my husband ought to just love me because the Bible tells me so. Yeah, you're right. He should. But it doesn't hurt for you to be nice to him. Amen. Cook him a little bit of bacon. <laughs> Amen. I'm just saying, it's a true statement. And uh, we think about that. Don't live to be popular, but be popular so you can honor and glorify God with your life. Amen. Remember to keep your eye on the goal. Some of the young and old live for Twitter followers. They live for likes on the Facebook. And it becomes an idol, a graven image, because they're not kept their eyes on the goal. Hey, be popular so you can live for the glory of God. Okay, application. Now, the application goes a lot, but this is really interesting because I'm going to go over some things that many don't even think about, but it's really interesting to begin to think about this. The Bible. We're a Bible-believing church, are we not? That's right. That's right. Amen. But what's the goal? Is the goal to read it 10 times through and get a bunch of people to pat you on the back and say what a great person you are? Is it to have a bunch of wealth of information? You know the Bible so well so people can look at you, pat on your back? Or do you read the Bible with a goal that you may know Him in the power of His resurrection? Amen. There's, Amen. there's differences right there. Right. And the difference is very big. Do you read the Bible? There were times in the Bible where the Pharisees, they knew the Scriptures, but they didn't know God. Right. And it's important you know God. The importance about the Scriptures is it shows and introduces you to the Almighty God. It has Amen. nothing to do with you and has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with the Creator, that I may know Him. And if you're not careful, the Bible, in the way you approach it, be can become an idol. Okay. I know that's dangerous grounds right there, but if you think about it, it's very true. Okay, it's in the Bible. But what about, what about prayer? What about prayer? Do you live to pray or do you pray to live? Now think with me. Pharisees. In the corners. 
in front of everybody. They lived to pray. God, look at me. Look at those poor sinners out there. You and I have a close relationship, and I love you, Lord. They lived to pray, but their heart was so far from the Lord. And so you don't live to pray, you pray to live. That praying became an idol, and that idol kept them with a relationship with God, and it became a sin. But when we pray to live, we pray to have a relationship with God. We pray, uh, as, the, uh, as the Bible talks about uh, some of the, uh, the ah, my mind went blank. Pharisees. Not the Pharisees. Don't pray like the Pharisees. The publican. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, forgive me. It had nothing to do with anybody else. It had everything to do with the relationship with God. Amen. You pray to live, not live to pray. And maybe you don't like the terminology, but I hope you get the understanding. Okay, what about this? What about church? Three to thrive. You ought to be here. Three to thrive, yes. But don't let church become an idol. Remember, do you live to go to church or do you go to church to live? And if you're not careful, even a good thing like church can become an idol. It's not the going to it necessarily, but when you begin to bow down and worship maybe a church building or a church in and of itself, and you're not seeing the God that the church represents right there, all of a sudden you're totally missing out on the great God and that church becomes an idol. A pastor, a pastor, a pastor is there to point you to Jesus. But many times a pastor can become an idol. Uh, pastor, you, you ought not bow down to worship me, you ought to bow down to worship the God I'm pointing you to. Amen. And when all of a sudden the pastor, all of a sudden you become worshiping him and thinking of him and saying, I'll do anything that pastor says. Yeah, let's go down and drink uh, Kool-Aid down in Guyana. Yeah. Mm. It's an idol. It's wrong. And the point being right there, there's many idols in our life, if we're not careful, that can keep us from a personal relationship with the Almighty God. What about giving? Well, pastor, I live to give. I live to give. Well, don't get live to give. Why don't you give to live? In other words, there are people in the Bible who gave, gave generously. They lived to give, but it really wasn't the giving. It was the adoration of God's or people looking at them, what great people they are for giving. And there's a big difference. The big difference. Don't live to give, but give to live. Give uh, your tithe. Give offerings because you want to please Him in all that you say and think so your relationship with God can be pure, can be right. Well, hopefully this is not foreign to our church. Hopefully this is beating a drumbeat that we already know. Okay, we'll go on a little bit further. What about soul winning? Do you live for soul winning or do you tell people about the Jesus because you love him? There's a difference. I live for soul winning. I live for soul winning. I led a thousand people to Christ. I led uh, 700 people to Christ. I... All of a sudden, that can become an idol and be put in the place of the Almighty God. By the way, I believe in soul winning. I do. I'm, I'm for it. Uh, praise God. I led a person to Christ yesterday. Okay, Amen. praise God. Amen. But it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Him. That's right. I'm trying to introduce somebody to the Almighty God. Yep. And if we're not careful, our idol of soul winning can become a false God that hinders our relationship with the Almighty God. What about your Sunday school class? Do you live for your Sunday school class or do you go to Sunday school class or have a Sunday school class to live for? Okay, some, this may not get this, but some people, look what I've done. Right. Look at how great I am. We have this. And by the way, that takes all the attention off of God and even a Sunday school can, class can become an idol. But we have Sunday school class, not for you and not for me necessarily, but it's to point people to the great God that we have, to introduce them to the word of God that shows them clearly the great God that we have. Amen. And it's an awesome thought when you, you think about it. How about your job? Well, pastor, I live for my job. Well, if you're not careful, if you live for that job, you can easily make your job an idol that hinders you from the relation with God. Don't live for a job, but have a job so you can live for Him. I want to see again. Have a job so you can live for Him. Oh, uh, now there's a couple more. We're almost done. But what about your family? Do you live for your family, or do you have a family to live? Okay, children. Do you live for your children, or do you have children to uh, children so you can live for God? 
Okay, maybe not getting this, but sometimes, well, pastor, I would do anything for my children. By the way, sometimes you'll put your children before the Almighty God. Sometimes you'll put your family before the Almighty God. And you can do it in so many different ways. And this is maybe a little bit in the meat here. Yes, it is. But you have a family so you can live for Him. Uh, and so important for you to understand that many things, a family can become an idol. A family can become an idol. Children can become an idol if you place them in front of God. Uh, back to the scripture. Now, listen with me right here. The of those things, and I really want you to read this and think about this uh, because this is a great truth that will change your life. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be out in you. It's putting God first in everything you say, think, and do. Above all, and when you have the proper motives, you have the proper structure right there, you have God first, you see the end result. It's all about him. For all to the glory of God, it changes you. Right. It changes you. If you put something in front of it, you, you lose, uh, you have hollow Christianity, by the way. You know, people want love, joy, peace, long suffering. They want the peace of passive understanding. They want joy unspeakable, full and glory. The only way possible to have that is a pure relationship with Him. Amen. But when you put an idol, whether it's a good thing, whether it's the Bible, or it's your family, or it's a church, or it's a pastor, or it's money, or it's food, it's a hollow, and you're miserable. Right. Amen. Do you understand that? But the opposite, when you uh, get rid of the, all those idols and everything's for Him, it changes you. Now, this is real quick. Back in Exodus chapter 20, there are some things that are important. Thou shalt now bow down thyself, the, all of that. But it says this. It says, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Wow. This rule reminds us of something. To forget the second rule for living spells disaster. Forgetfulness works disaster not just in your life, but in your children's life. This rule reminds us that the sins of the father are visited to the children to the third and fourth generation. It's very true. Our children are punished for our sins, or are rather they're punished by them even to the third and fourth generation. And this is a terrible thing about sin. Those parents that get so absorbed in the worship of something other than the Almighty God lose the real God out of their lives, and they end up robbing not only themselves, but their sons and daughters, and make life far more difficult for them. It's a reminder of that. So that's why it's so important for you to think very clearly about what was the second commandment. Is there anything that you put before the Almighty God? If you do, it's going to hurt not just you, but your children, your children's children. Amen. But the opposite is true. If you look at that last part, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Praise God for parents who keep their eyes on the goal. Keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the goal. They don't ever allow a person, an object, a job, or anything ever to become an idol in their life. They never allow that in their life. And when they do, boy, mercy and help for their children into a thousand generations. And we think about that. Praise God for that. Hey, does make, thou shalt not make any graven image have anything to do with you and me? Absolutely. Keep your eyes on the goal. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you.